and uh, our timing was just poor and and we hadn't finished our neighborhood anyway. So we, I said, let's go finish our neighborhood. So we got just a door down the road and uh, one door from the house and this young man walked past and I introduced myself to him. And he had a bunch of little kids with him and he had a, a wagon with two little babies in it. And I say babies, they were about the age of Caitlin, or not Caitlin, Brenna, and they were around 16, 18 months, something like that, a little older. And uh, I got to talking to him and I said, uh, you got a set of twins there. He said, I do. I said, could I ask you a personal question? Were your, uh, were your twins diagnosed at birth with a life-threatening disease? And he looked at me and he said, well, yeah, how did you know? I said, our church prayed for your twins. Our church had them on our prayer list for the first three months of their life until I got news that the diagnosis was that they were whole, that they did not have it. He looked at me and I said, your mom told me. I said, I live right there. Somehow she found out I was a preacher. And for some reason, she came by my house and said, I heard you're a preacher and I want your church to pray for my grandkids. And uh, I said, I go to a church that prayed for your grand, for your children. He looked at me and I had a, I mean, it was just to have that interaction to actually, I said, I've, my wife and I have talked and prayed about meeting these children one day. And I told him, I said, I'd like to see him in church one day. And uh, so you just pray, and his name is Marquise, and just pray that maybe one day they'll come to church. And uh, that was an exciting visit to me. I'm like, my church prayed for you or two kids right there. And uh, so that's pretty neat to be able to talk about what our church does and praying for people. And we ought to remember to lift people up in prayer. Questions and answers. The Bible has the answers. It also has questions. We are full of questions. The Bible is our answer book. I'm going to go over a couple real quick. The first one, two weeks ago, there was a question asked to me. How old was Jesus when he died? And I said, I'm not exactly sure. I know what I believe as far as I've been taught, but I wasn't sure. And so I said, we need to go to the scriptures for it. And so I went and I read and I read and I read. And I found one verse John chapter 8 John chapter 8 in John chapter 8 I can give you for certain one thing, in John chapter 8, verse 57. <laughs> then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? I know one thing, he wasn't fifty at this time. That's what I know. I've been taught that he was 33. And so I did some out of the Bible research and I found that the ages vary from 33 to 40. And then some, there is no clear Bible reference. Yes, the same age. From the beginning, he was always alive. He always was God, so therefore he always had God with him. So he never ever was one that had to get saved because he was never a sinner. From his baptism, we have speculation, but there's an Old Testament passage that says the priests had to be, that the priests were baptized from 30 years old and upward. So, 30 is the 
general starting consensus for baptism, but it doesn't say specifically that he was baptized at the age of 30. It's a general reference to his statement, thus becometh to fulfill all righteousness and to fulfill the law. But we speculate, but the Bible does not say exactly. So baptism for a priest was not at the age of 30. It was from 30 on up, so 30 and older. So we know that Jesus was either 30 or older when he got baptized. That's what we know. And that's all I know. The rest is speculation. So, did you learn anything? Or did you just get more confused about what you had been taught all your life? Does anybody have an age that they were taught that Jesus was when he died? Anybody say, I know what I was taught all my life. I was taught all my life, 33 as well. I was taught that as well. And I'm going to say I still believe it was around there and possibly there. But because I have no actual Bible and no actual historical evidence to clearly tell, then it's an assumption. So, there we have it. Are we any smarter? Actually, we are. We are, we are wiser, I should say, because we know, we know that all these years we may have stood emphatically and we would probably stand at a door and tell somebody, the Bible says Jesus was 30. How many of you think before today you would have told somebody, I know the Bible says he was 33? Many would. And about two weeks ago, when the question came up, my mind wanted to say, oh, Jesus was 33. My mind wanted to say that. But we don't go and give a statement without having the Bible first. So I, I know what I wanted to say last week or two weeks ago. I wanted to, but I knew I couldn't because we're supposed to go to the scriptures and not give our opinions. So... Jesus had hair. Yes. We can, we can get on that. Uh, we can deal with that one. I'm not going to deal with that one tonight. So that, were, that was a question. And there's the answer. I don't know how old he was exactly when he died. He is the ancient of days. But his, his physical body, however many years it had, but there's not. So there's a lot of things that we will specifically deal with. That the Bible teaches this and the Bible teaches that. And then we read the scripture and we're like, well, I've been taught that, but didn't find it. Another one that was that came up was how long did Jesus suffer on the cross? Um, we'll deal with that. We'll go to the book of Matthew first. I'm gonna, this one may take just a little bit longer. Um, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. Jesus Christ suffered greatly for us. We dealt with, we had the Lord's Supper Sunday evening. And as we reflect on the suffering of Jesus Christ, there ought to be a solemnness to it. A time that we realize that it wasn't just a movie or a show. It wasn't just a game and it was not a criminal dying for their sin. It was God in the flesh dying for our sin. But in Matthew 27, verse 45, Matthew 27, 45 says, Now from the sixth hour, okay, remember these numbers, okay? From the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood, by, stood there 
when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. So we have, at this point on the cross, what the Bible says from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. That's three hours. Jesus was on the cross, listen carefully, in the dark. Okay? Three hours on the cross in the dark. That's when God shut out the lights. God turned the lights out. The earth went dark. There was no visibility. God blanketed the earth in darkness. He has done that a couple of times. One time the whole earth, one time he did it in a locale in Egypt. He put blackness over the land. So remember those numbers. From the sixth to the ninth hour, there was darkness while Jesus was on the cross. Mark, Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, verse 25. Verse 25 says, and it was the third hour and they crucified him. Okay. So generally speaking, according to the Hebrew day, the day would start at six o'clock in the morning. So six o'clock technically would be the, the start So seven would be your first hour, eight o'clock would be your second, nine o'clock would be your third hour. So according to the Hebrew day starting, this would have been nine o'clock in the morning. So remembering from Mark, Mark said they crucified him at the third hour. The sixth hour, the sun went dark. The ninth hour, Jesus died. So how many hours would that be? From the third to the sixth, there was still light. From the sixth to the ninth, it was dark. So how many hours would that be? Six hours on the cross. Now, keep that in mind. I'm going to continue reading here, starting in verse 26. And the super, the superscription of his accusations was written over the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucify two thieves, the one on his right hand, the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. He said he was going to, so they used what he said to mock him. (laughs) Ah, you're the one that said this, mocking him with his own words. Not, re- re- not knowing that he was talking about his own body, his own temple, physical body that he was going to resurrect in three days. The Bible teaches that they did not know that, but he was clearly talking about his own physical body when he said it. Save thyself and come down from the cross. Verse 31, likewise also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is my being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth for Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. So it seems like Mark has a pretty clear all the way through the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour. 
Luke 23. You say, we've already got it figured out. Why are you going on? I'm glad you asked because I'm going to show you something that you're going to say, now, wait a minute. The Bible contradicts itself. Don't you all believe that? Good. I'm glad you don't. You need to go into this knowing that the Bible is not wrong. It does not contradict itself. We can contradict ourselves and we can contradict the scriptures. Luke chapter 23, verse number um, 23. I don't know. Um, it doesn't say when it started, but in verse 44 are the hours that are used in this one. Verse 44, and it was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now, we have those three passages that give, all of them give the sixth to the ninth hour. One of them gives the actual when he was crucified, when they started the crucifixion, the third hour. Now look at John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Verse number 14. And it was about, and it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour, he said unto the Jews, behold your king. And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king, but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Now, there's a lot of people that argue about this one, and they say, well, John says it was the sixth hour. Well, very well could be the sixth hour. It very well could be. It could have been, according to John, but what was he dealing with? Remember this, John was not with the other apostles. Where was John? John was inside. Everybody else was outside. So John is dealing with from the inside as they lead him away. The others are on the outside when they see the crucifixion starting. So according to this, now here's the thing. The sixth hour, John is dealing with a different time frame. John is dealing with the Romans in their judgment hall. And he's looking at everything from a different perspective. Remember the study that we did that John saw Jesus carrying the cross. The other disciples saw Simon carrying the cross. John saw a lot of things differently. His hour looks different. His timing looks different. But what John was looking at was when the trial was when he was being led away. I don't believe that John was referring to the actual crucifixion, but when he was being led away. And it had to take Jesus a little bit of time to get from that judgment hall to where they crucified him. I don't believe he ran to where he was crucified in his condition. And so I believe that John is also referring to basically the Roman timing, which would be like six o'clock in the morning. And so approximately from six o'clock in the morning, to the third hour of the Hebrew time, which would be nine o'clock, there was a three-hour time space between what John was seeing 
and when they started the actual crucifixion. I believe John was looking at it from the Roman point of view, the day starting at midnight and six, from six in, at six in the morning, which Jesus would have been abused and beaten and wore out that night. And then the Hebrews dealing with their timing and their time frame, nine o'clock in the morning is the actual crucifixion started three hours after the trial had ended. So you have not a discrepancy in time because if you said, well, the sixth hour, the sixth hour when he's being led out of the judgment hall, according to the Hebrew time, what would be the sixth hour? The sixth hour would be noon, right? According to the Hebrew time, the sixth hour would be noon. So John would be saying they're leading Jesus away at noon and the other disciples are saying, well, he was being crucified at nine. So I believe they're looking at it from two different perspectives. Everything about John's perspective of the crucifixion is different. John saw it from being with Jesus in the temple or at the judgment hall. And as they led Jesus away, John sees Jesus going away. And the other disciples see Jesus coming out. And they saw it from a different perspective. So I believe it's not a discrepancy some people say, well, John said it was, it, he was being led away at six. And the others say, well, Jesus was on the cross at the sixth hour. And he was already on the cross for three hours. So was John wrong? I don't believe he was. I believe they were looking at it from two different perspectives. The sixth hour, according to the Romans, would be six in the morning. The sixth hour, according to the Hebrews, would be noon. Their calendars, their days, everything was different. And so John being in the Roman judgment hall using the Roman time where the others being outside going off of their Hebrew timing. So I don't believe there's any discrepancy. I believe Jesus' trial ended at six o'clock in the morning, according to John. That his crucifixion, according to the other three, started at nine o'clock and ended at three o'clock or the ninth hour, nine hours from six in the morning. And he was on the cross for six hours. So you have a total of nine hours there, six on the cross and three where he was uh, brutally abused and then marched away to carry that cross. And for nine hours, Jesus suffered in the condition that he was in until he gave up the ghost. Now I'm going to close, but I don't believe that was all the suffering he did. I believe he suffered in the garden of Gethsemane where it said he sweat as if it were great drops of blood in his prayer, in his time dealing with the Father, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus suffered a lot for us. He suffered a lot for us. Nine hours of some of the most excruciating pain, six of those on the cross, and three of those just on his way to his cross. Something to think about. I'm going to close with one more verse. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Those were questions that, or answers to questions that were asked. This one was not asked. I believe the Bible teaches that we as believers are without excuse. That we are, if we are a believer, that we are going to live for God. We ought to live for God. We are going to live for God. It is going to be natural to us. And I want to look here at Romans chapter 6. I want you to look at three verses. Verse number 19. Actually, four verses. Verse 19 says, Romans 6, 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so now, yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. When you were lost in sin, righteousness had no sway in your life. None whatsoever. You cannot trust a lost person to live righteously. You can't. They will live as they were taught, maybe by... Um, general teachings of their parents, but 
that's maybe the way they were raised, but it's not righteousness. It's just living the way they were taught. There's a lot of good people in this world, but it doesn't mean they are righteous. They're not doing it for God. They're doing it just because that's the way they were raised or taught. Verse 21, I wanted to look at this word. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? What fruit was there? For the end of those things is death. The fruit of sin, the wages of sin, the fruit, what comes from sin is death, always death. Look at verse 22. But now being made free from sin, you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You are no longer under the bounds of sin. You are no longer owned by sin. Sin has no more ownership of you. I want you to look at these words and become servants to God. What does this next phrase say? Ye have your fruit unto holiness. Ye have your fruit unto holiness.